Welcome everybody. My name is uh, Boris Sieber, the CEO of Tag Marshall. Welcome to our expert session how Fieldstone Golf Course uses data and technology to increase revenue and transform operations. I am delighted to have an old friend of ours back, uh, Chip Hurlehai, the GM, uh, PGA General Manager, sorry, of Fieldstone Golf Club. Uh, Chip, how are you this morning? I'm wonderful. How are you? I am good, thank you. Um, I got uh, private lessons to pronounce Chip's last name, <laughs> which I'm told is of Irish descent. So, how did I do, Chip? You did very well. I gave I give my gave my child private lessons in how to pronounce her last name too. So, kind of goes with the territory. Nice. Yeah, um, I have. Uh, a problematic first name even though it's so simple once you read it but I have a lot of fun going to Starbucks and just saying my name and then I get a different version every time and no no it's not a single time has anyone ever got it right so if you asked uh, Starbucks for uh, on a second name basis I think or surname basis I think uh, you'd get similar results <laughs> um, okay let's uh, um, get to know Fieldstone uh, Golf Course and also uh, Chip uh, who's been around the block in the golfing industry. Chip, tell us about uh, the operation that you head up and where you situated and also how you got uh, to be there at this point in your career. Sure. Fieldstone Golf Club was is, what is owned by the City of Auburn Hills. Um, we are in Northern Oakland County uh, in Michigan, um, about 25 minutes from downtown Detroit, so North Metro Detroit. The golf course opened in 1998. Uh, it was a redesign and um, they brought in Arthur Hills as the architect and um, its reputation quickly grew. And it continued to grow from 98 um, until I came in, in 2019 or the spring of 2020 i guess was when i was actually hired and the the one of the goals we talked about is how do we continue to develop what a golf course that already has a great reputation a golf course that already has great conditioning how do we continue to grow that facility and i feel like over the last three years or four seasons we've actually been very successful in doing that um, so Chip, just a uh, trip down memory lane, you pretty much started just before the world ended and time stopped for a short while, right? I, I did. I was actually hired in 2019. I started in early March of 2020, right before the world stopped. Um, I was I was in my position for about 10 days to two weeks, and then I was basically sent home for six weeks. Wow. And I thought it would net the golf business would never be the same after that. And it certainly hasn't. That is very true. Um, and uh, after six weeks of enforced um, pausing, uh, you were hit by quite an avalanche alongside everybody else, right? We were. We I don't think anyone was expecting that. And I've spoken about this on several other occasions, but I always I always didn't know what to expect coming into out of the start of COVID and what 2020 was actually going to be like. Um, mm -hmm. And I think most of us in the golf business ended up seeing that as kind of a high, what we thought at the time was a high watermark for the golf business was really 2020 COVID in COVID in Michigan. Um, there wasn't really, everything else was pretty much shut down. There wasn't anything mm -hmm. else that you could do. Um, we had, we had a lot of new players coming into the game um, and the opportunity to be outside certainly enhanced that. Um, yeah, it certainly did. I mean, the, the industry data is um, has been spoken about a lot, right? We, we learned about 15% increase in play volume and about 3 million people joined the game or dusted off their, their clubs after many years of uh, having them deserted in the garage. And that was amazing. Um, but the the challenge obviously is how do we sustain it and how do we uh, make sure that um, yeah we keep uh, keep that good momentum going 
and a lot can go wrong, right? If you don't get it right. Uh, but uh, you and your team have certainly performed right through today as we sit here. Um, and we're here to learn a bit more how you got to do that after your first season, which was um, yeah, quite tough from a management point of view. Uh, right. Then I mean, it was a it was a situation for us where we had a we had a long discussion about pace of play that had always been an issue at Fieldstone. When I was hired in 2019, there wasn't really anything that we were going to do about it in 2020. Nobody's shipping anything. Um, most businesses were closed. Uh, it was a situation where I kind of knew the direction that we had to go, and during that a lot of that down period, um, I was reaching out to different experts that I knew in the business and kind of, kind of just trying to, trying to think forward as to how we could solve this pace of play problem. And thank goodness we partnered with Tag Marshall and I think that would have been the late August of 2020. So it was all happening behind the scenes while we're dealing with players and mm. still trying to move the facility forward. Yeah, no, I remember that. And uh, um, yeah, it, it was uh, quite a crazy time. And I remember at the time we, and this is now, it seems like ancient history, but we actually got so much information from our partners that we have in Ireland and Spain and Scotland because uh, the, the pandemic at the time, as it was rolling out, just, had a two-week head start on that side of the globe, right? And right. those operators, um, they very quickly came up with ideas of how they could uh, keep open their facilities and how they could uh, turn things um, low touch and, and things like that. And uh, and we actually held um, just an information session webinar with a few um, uh, managers and uh, just to share as much information as we could at the time, uh, because we realized that this was really extraordinary and and we obviously have a, a far reaching platform now um we thought let's try and use this and, and see how we can help each other um and yeah to think that you just started out at fieldstone at that very moment um i can just imagine the the helter skelter and the uncertainty that that brought with it but uh like we said that seems like a decade ago and uh, we're all better for it now um, we've certainly grown uh, immensely uh, since that alongside the golf industry. And if you'll allow me just a brief introduction to Tag Marshall, we now have tracked you know, way more than 30 million rounds. In fact, this summer on a busy weekend, we're tracking uh, more than a million rounds of golf. Um, not all of them played at Fieldstone. <laughs> uh, we're very fortunate that we get to work with some of the very best um, operators um, in the private club space as your hazel team the amazing two-time rider coast uh, cup host there's valhalla hosting next year's pa champs uh, there's uh, pebble beach in the resort space and the uh, daily fee pinehurst hosting us open next year visiting straits and um, our very very first partner that we ever had that ever paid us a dollar for our system was aaron hills here in 2015 and they already were earmarked to host the us open so we got uh, very lucky that they said this is exactly what we've been looking for and uh, the rest is history now we're working with over 500 partners and a, a lot of them including Aaron hills are now going into uh, their third uh, contract with us working um, from seven to nine years of partnership and uh, yeah we're obviously very blessed that we get to learn from a lot of these very good managers and um, as much as we're excited to work with these top facilities, the biggest impact that we're seeing that our system makes is really in the middle of the road, good um, daily fee and private club space that is not as well resourced, and uh, but solving the same problems, right? And and that's exactly what we designed our system to do, so so that we can make a difference there. And uh, that yeah, that's why I'm so excited to have Chip uh, back on with us because we spoke about two years ago. And already um, Fieldstone were doing amazingly in terms of results, both from a, a you know, pace of play and play experience um, optimization point of view, but also from a revenue standpoint, obviously, like we're here to help an operator save money and make money. Otherwise, uh, there's no point in in, uh, in starting a, a partnership. 
Um, but uh, taking a step back, uh, Chip, you obviously, uh, Fieldstone is not the first um, operation that you're running. Um, you also obviously have the PGA pedigree as a PGA GM. Uh, you have, I don't know if you've ever looked back on your career, how many thousands of rounds you've actually uh, managed. If you think about it, you're probably also close to um, half a million or so, probably more. Um, I don't know if you've ever done this uh, this exercise, but uh, if you're looking at uh, what do you feel are the critical factors when it comes to the player experience? There's a list down here uh, that in no particular order, if you had to pick three, which three would you pick? So for me, I I would, uh, first of all, I would say I spent a number of years early in my career on the resort side and the daily fee side. I managed five clubs at one time um, in Northern Virginia. So I, and then I spent 25 years of my career on the private club side, and now I'm back in the daily fee side. So it's been an interesting journey. Um for me, I think at Fieldstone in particular, I think number one for us, course conditioning. Um, we're we're fortunate that we have an incredible superintendent um, and his team who do a great job with our golf course. Um, he, they're fantastic. So we are very pleased with course conditioning. Um, I think for me, I think also number two right below that is pace and flow of play. And then accessibility and tea time availability are always something that we it's always a difficult it's always a difficult hoop for us to get everyone through is we only have an 18 old golf course we do tea time we run tea times every nine minutes um and for the most part if we're not um if you haven't if you don't have a tea time at fieldstone two weeks in advance it's really a challenge to get a starting time um Thanks for that um, insight, uh, Chip. Would you say that those three, would you have called those out when you were a private club manager looking after members? Would it have been the same? I would I would say course conditioning, yes. Pace and flow of play, yes. Um, I might change that to, um, if I was on the private club space, I would say clubhouse and amenities were, mm -hmm. were pretty critical at at pretty critical to what we do um but yeah it's the course conditioning and pace of play that for i think it doesn't matter what side of the golf business you're on whether it's daily fee or private club um it those are the two that kind of stick out to me as the most mm -hmm. important um great um i've asked our audience to also have an opinion and see what they feel are the top three. So I'm getting some poll results here that um, you can't see. I'm going to share them in just a minute. If anyone hasn't clicked the buttons yet, now is your uh, last 10 seconds, if you wouldn't mind. Um, what do you think are the top three? And then we will share what our audience thought. Okay, three, two, one, and poll and share results. So now you should be able to see them. Um, so our audience thought uh, course conditioning top, pace and flow of play third, and course design second, sorry, and course design third. Um, those are all good picks. Look, all of these are important, right? Like if you're um, an operator with uh, your thought, you want to pay attention to all of them. But if you have to really focus, um, there are some things that are just non-negotiable. And the uh, industry data supports um, your view here a chip and on the right we have the a broad-based usga research uh, survey that they did where they asked golfers what are the critical enjoyment factors for you golfers and 84 82 percent said um cost conditioning 74 percent said pace and flow of play and in between that i don't quite recall but i think 76 percent said who is in my playing group right the players that i'm grouped with so those are the top three enjoyment factors uh, that are critical to golfers. And then on the left, we have the NGCOAs, uh, much more recent results um, where they're asking operators and course owners, what are you going to focus on when it comes to the play experience and what do you see as critical? And course conditioning, again, comes out top undisputedly. And you did mention that you have an amazing superintendent and their crew and the magic that they do. And that is 
no doubt a huge foundation of your success. Pace of play here comes in third, just behind a welcoming attitude towards women, which has been identified as key. And then the physical beauty aesthetics of the golf course, that's probably design slash conditioning and then cost and value. I would argue that if you got a nice and conditioned course and you get people through with good uh, with a good pace, that's value. Um, are you surprised by these uh, outcomes, Chip? I'm I'm not surprised by them. I think they kind of validate what I said earlier. I think my top two were their top. Everyone else's yep. top two. So I think we're kind of all in the same place. I guess my me getting getting people on the golf course is a challenge for us, but that might be limited to that might be more limited to our particular facility. Mm. Our location um, is one that is very accessible. It's easy to get to. Um, a lot of people know where we are. Um, so it's always a challenge for us. We, we tend to run out of starting times. Mm, sure. Um, while we're on that and before we dig into the technology side of things, Chip, um, how many rounds do you do a season more or less, or obviously there's the, pre-COVID, post-COVID difference, but uh, what has been your um, your your play volume like that you, that you're driving? At the so we have a limited point. season in in Metro Detroit. Our season we tend to start about the first of April. We end about the last weekend in October. Sometimes we go a little bit later. Sometimes we start a little bit earlier. But our core season is really Memorial Day through Labor Day. And okay. that we do about 40,000 rounds of golf on an annual basis. Yeah, yeah that is busy um, given the short uh, available window um, and no doubt a, a challenge to manage. So let's uh, look at how you are doing that. How Fieldstone is using technology and data to transform operations. Um, here's a little quote that um gets quoted many a time what gets measured gets managed if you can't measure it you can't improve it we are talking about the, the power of data and also benchmarking so that we know where we're headed and uh, obviously traditionally um operators have done this with financial data right but the financial data i would say is an outcome rather than a driver of what you're doing uh, i would always argue that what happens out on the golf course is the economic engine of uh, the golf operation. Um, so the question is how using tech and data, um, tell us a little bit about the, the tag marshal system that you have deployed at Fieldstone. And then we're gonna look at what that looks like for you um, and your players, but also yeah, tell us, the system that you have and also who do you have dialed into this like who's looking at that information so from our side we have the we have the screens with the monitors on the golf cars um i like what that does for the player i think it gives them a lot of information um i and i've always i've said this from time to time in other in other webinars and seminars that i've done um I love that our players can see that screen, but quite honestly, as an operator, I don't really care what it does for the player. I care what it does for me. And what it does for me is it takes all of the question marks out of every conversation I have to have with a guest regarding pace of play. We're not, we're not talking about people's perception of pace of play or perception of the group in front of them. I can look at data and I can tell if that group in front of them is on pace, under pace, over pace. And it's a lot easier when that phone call comes in and says, I'm on hole number five and there's a group in front of me that um, is taking, taking too long. Well, first of all, they may be a twosome behind another foursome, but I can look at the data on that group in front of them and I can say, no, they're actually 12 minutes under pace. Mm -hmm and under their goal pace. So they're not slow. And the fact that you're a twosome, it might feel a little slow to you, um, but that's the situation. We do try to do our best to pair people. Um, we try to not send out twosome, particularly on the weekend and holidays, but occasionally that happens where we get a twosome on the golf course. And typically that's where our problem lies. Um, it's, it's 
perception. It's not reality. So it brings it brings the discussion back to reality. Yeah, that's uh, I'm hearing that often, right? Perception becomes reality, especially if you're a, um, aggrieved as a player. And then sometimes, uh, no matter what the reality that presents, you interpret it in a certain way. And at that moment, you just feel, yeah, you've been held up and uh, and something was very wrong. But um, before we look at what it is that, uh, that, that your team actually looks at, uh, let me just quickly summarize the rest of the system options so we have what we call this classic mobile unit which we have in play with a lot of uh, golf courses that do walking rounds or caddy rounds so that's your banded dunes or also course down the road that may have 20 or 30 percent walkers right we also have a mobile option um, and then as chip said this is our eight inch um, it's a super high definition it's probably the brightest screen screen you can get in in the industry at this point and we have a hidden away tracker too, because we realize the screen is not for everyone. And some uh, operators just want to know where their carts are and, and obviously protect their turf and also keep their players accountable. But all of what these units do is they feed data into our cloud service. And that's where the data gets processed and analyzed and gets fed back to um, the managers and everyone that's dialed in at the club. And you can look at it on a PC. You can look at it on a tablet you can look at it on your phone even and there's two core benefits here one is the real-time live data so this is a little bit like ways of google maps of, of what's happened on your golf course and then we've got the underpin of all the important metrics of um, the the performance of both the players out there over time or on a single day but also your team and how they're managing things and like i said before um to me really this is the economic engine of the golf course because as good as our restaurant is and as as great as our pro shop is if we didn't have legs out on our golf course they probably wouldn't see much traffic right so that is uh, auxiliary secondary revenue but it's all driven by the the value and the quality of the product that we deliver out in the golf course. So photo, um, I can interrupt just one second if you can go back to that screen. Yeah. So there was a period of time this year where we were transitioning from the old screen to the new screen, and we didn't we use the tags. We use the classic tags. We were waiting for the new screens to be installed. It was a short period of time, but it really that really helped us a lot. And then um, as far as as far as the screens and the tablets, both my first tea host or starter, they have a they have their own tablet and both of our and our ranger on the golf course has a tablet as well. And then I have a designated I have a designated PC at the in the back of the golf shop that we use to monitor pace of play and basically on a on a Saturday or Sunday morning in particular, that's me that's sitting there monitoring pace of play and looking at that screen. Um, but then we also have a big screen TV that we project it all to. Um, and I do that and that faces the guests when they check in so that they see that and they know that when they, when they check in, they know that we're actually watching and we're actually monitoring and we actually care about pace of play. So I think that kind of ties, we've seen all of it. So it kind of ties it all together. Yeah, the, the big screen is a is a great move. And uh, that's uh, $400 well spent, right? Because every single player that comes through a pro shop sees the live data. And, and uh, once they're a little bit familiar, they actually uh, probably feel very comforted that um, it's a good pace again, uh, going out at Fieldstone. And uh, you guys are on top of things. Um, let's quickly look at what this looks like. And uh, we are talking about technology here. And as much as um, obviously we're delighted that we have such a strong partner in Fieldstone for Tag Marshall, um, I know Fieldstone also works very well with uh, the four up uh, T sheet um, system and Sagacity for uh, dynamic pricing, which we, we're going to uh, go into. Um, a little bit later, but um, it, so technology needs to work together, right? So that you can get the best possible outcomes. And for us, it, it's a um, obvious uh, decision that we want to integrate with as many um, good systems as we can, just so operators like you can have the the choice and you can get the 
the, the best systems and get them to work in tandem uh, so that you can get the outcomes. Uh, but Chip, um, yeah, so the of the people that have you you've got dialed into this, and you mentioned that some of this you really want to do yourself, but obviously your team is dialed in really well. Um, give us an example of what it is that they see here on this map, assuming that quite a few of the people on this webinar have never seen a live map of ours and they don't necessarily know the colors and how things work. So it's going to sound like we planned this, but we really didn't. Um, the whole five fairway. There's an example. You've got you've got cart 17 who looks like they might be slow and and I, it looks like maybe 18 and 19 are playing together but let's just assume that 18 is that twosome hmm. and i start to get the phone call because they're waiting on 5t for this group that's actually six minutes under pace and with a four hour 31 minute projected round estimate so it's a lot easier to have those conversations with people when you can you can actually bring data to the table and and discuss that that way. I think it's much much better than just everyone's perception of what's going on. So yeah, I think this is a perfect example of it. Um, so just to round off here, so we can see the geofences that your team has set up, and also most of the course is green, right? So in our world, that means these guys are good; they're on pace. And then we have this one big icon, magenta, purple color, that really is a slow group that's holding up two groups behind. And here's a red group, they're a bit out of position, but they're currently not impacting anyone. And um, do you remember a time when you used to have people out uh, looking for gaps in the fields and trying to figure out when did this group start, where the, the should they be right now with some sort of manual grid and then trying to have these conversations? Um, do you remember a time uh, that, and uh, yeah, I know that for a couple of days, actually the, the season, you had to do that all over again, right? Uh, while you're transitioning from one system to the other. Um, that's not fun when it's busy, is it? <laughs> it's not fun when it's busy, but I really like this. You picked a good day because I really like this. If you look at, at cards one, two, and three on 17 and 16, they are both green, which means they're yeah. going to finish. Uh, they're going to finish either on pace or under pace. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a good day for us. It's our issues arise when when those cards one, two and three are actually magenta or even if they're red and they're not really holding anyone up. But you recognize there's going to be problems, which is particularly why on the weekends I'm the one that sits and manages it from the golf shop and yeah i remember those days well when we would send people out and we say just go out and try to figure out what's going on mm. well now i don't have to figure out what's going on we already know what's going on and we try to we we do have we do use the system to interact with guests um, from time to time but when we have to have serious conversations with guests um, i like to do that face to face mm. um, so this this allows me the opportunity to send people where I know their problems and and just looking back on at cart six um, that probably it doesn't show the whole screen but there probably is a group back there on 14 T that's being a little bit delayed and um, they're starting to see some problems start right there so we we would probably at that point send someone out to. 15 and and start to ride backwards and communication with the golf shop communication with me they'll have a tablet they'll be able to know what's going on they'll be able to have data discussions with people and not perception discussions with people um and i think that's an important point um, that you're making uh, again uh, um yeah in a recent conversation you did say that your team are now so dialed into it they ne they would never go out without the data in hand um and your team is quite varied right from an age and uh, sort of technology experience point of view tell us a little bit how they've picked up um the learning around the system and um and who are your champions within the team that uh, that are so a lot in? of our staff is a lot of our staff is older sec i won't I'll say second career retired. They retired from their original career and now they love golf, love to play golf, want to be a part of it. 
Um, so we've we've taken them into a new second career. Um, a lot of those folks are are older. Um, technology was a challenge for them. Um, I my first tea host is an older gentleman. Um, you wouldn't expect him to be the first one in my office on a Saturday morning, making sure that he's got the tablet so he can figure out what's going on. And then um, same thing, my my golf cart storage facility staff, my outside services staff, they will they'll have a tablet so that they can tell where carts are so we can get them cleaned and turned and back out for an afternoon round. Um, so yeah, it's it's interesting. And then on the younger side, um, one of my assistant golf professionals is 23. The other one, um, I think today's his birthday. He just turned 26. So um, those guys love technology, and in some ways, they they help me. So I I'm kind of on that. I won't say that I'm the oldest person in the room, but. Um, Technology was new for me, and it's a struggle sometimes, and these guys help guide me through that, so I'm fortunate with that. Yeah, I'm hearing this uh, a lot, Chip, that um, a senior manager would say, well, I need to get the right tools so that my team can be successful, right? And part of your team are younger guys, and they live their lives on their smartphones, right? And they grew up um, learning how to operate a, a, a laptop or a computer from age eight or something, right? So that's just their world. Um, and uh, yeah, it really says a lot about a, a manager if they're saying, well, I want these guys to be successful. I'm going to teach them what I can from a management point of view, from a people skills point of view, um, and let them drive the technology and together we make a good team. And it seems like uh, you got the mix right. Um, but you ne you didn't even you didn't always have to uh, assistance, and uh, that is a fairly new uh, development, right? No, we had we had we had one we had one assistant golf professional um, until last year, and then because of the additional revenue and that operating profit we've been able to provide to the city of Auburn Hills, we were fortunate enough that that I was allowed to hire another assistant golf professional. So from that perspective, it's been it's been really a win-win. Nice. So we're going to talk about that uh, in just a few minutes, but uh, let's take a quick look at what the golfers actually see. Um, and as much as you um, don't mess around and you said, actually, you don't really care that much what the golfers see as long as you get what you need out of it. Uh, but it's certainly helpful to them. <laughs> and ultimately, again, it's a win-win, right? Um, so... Uh, yeah, the the system obviously is center mount, top of the cart. We will install in any golf cart. Uh, remind me what fleet uh, you guys have at uh, at Fieldstone. We have a club car fleet, so we have the precedents. Um, and uh, Chip mentioned this earlier. So at the bottom is the pace status that the group has, much like Chip Chip and his team have got the the colors on the map. It's the same color for the group, so they more pace aware. And then it's got all the good things that you would expect, the the range finding, the interaction, and uh, you can dial in your food and beverage and things like that. Um, and we're calling it two-way because obviously there's two-way messaging that comes with it. And and I know that um, yeah, anywhere around Lake Michigan, um, there is uh, thunderstorms rolling in on a regular basis. Tell us a little bit how the system helps you manage, uh, keep your players safe and, and, uh, and uh, make sure that things work out. So prior to the installation of the system at Fieldstone, we managed we managed weather like everyone else. We looked at we looked at lightning.org and we became our own meteorologists and then went out and blew horns. Sometimes those horns were heard, sometimes those horns were not heard. It's nice now when we get weather, we still have to be our own meteorologist, but when we get inclement weather, we can just send out a weather alert which means all I have to worry about is making sure, I know that all the players in golf cars are gonna get that information and get that return to clubhouse and inclement weather warning. All I have to do at Fieldstone is, is manage the, the few groups of walkers, which are typically junior golfers. Um, and we just go out and bring them in. So it really has helped us be a lot more efficient in getting people off the golf course. It's definitely helped from a safety perspective um, and I, I just feel like that is a 
bonus to the system that I really didn't I really didn't look at when we when we looked at purchasing a, a new GPS system for Fieldstone, but the weather alert has really been beneficial to us. Um, and on that note, I know that you've also got, uh, and we saw that on the map, quite a few geofences set up. And uh, so the way that the system handles that, if somebody enters an area they're not supposed to be in, it um, pops up an alert and you, the, the course staff can set this up at various alert degrees. And the top one would then just beep at the players until they're out. And it's it's like a track reversing, basically. Um, the main reason, obviously, is we want to keep players compliant. We want to keep our, our turf protected. And, and every now and then, um, we have to water protect our, um, our setup. How is that working out? And uh, yeah, do the, the players play along? And is your superintendent happy with uh, the results that he's getting? So we use... So this is kind of jumping back to what we talked about earlier. You always try to hire to your weakness, right? So my weakness was the technology part of it, but the strength of having a young superintendent um, who's trying to make a name for himself is I task him with you. You you want to keep people out of certain areas. You build the geo fences. So my superintendent built the geo fences. And I think that's why we have so many. He mm. knew what he wanted. He knew what he wanted it to look like. And we've refined it over the years. But, and I think right now we have it pretty well dialed in. Um, and I think that's a testament to, to his dedication mm. and him wanting to make sure that, that he's protecting the golf course as much as possible. When I came to Fieldstone, we had a lot of ropes everywhere. We have very few ropes on the golf course now. I just use geofences. And I think from an aesthetic standpoint, it's it it's a lot better look. It's a lot cleaner look. Um, and we can manage everything using the geofences. But I know a lot of people look at that and they say, oh my gosh, that's so much work. I actually think it, took him about four or five hours to actually build those geo fences sure and then from there it was just refining them it's um it's a lot more work to fix a mess <laughs> or to keep uh, things roped off and adjust roping right actually um and you don't even have to get out there so it, it's great that you dialed in so nicely and maybe just one comment here um we allow for templates so a template can be set up to be just activated, deactivated, can be activated at a certain time, time of day, day of week. Um, we have some of our operators that have got um, a whole operational um, geofence set up at night or after hours, right? And if anything moves, there's an alert generated because of... Um, yeah, potential theft and um, you know those things that can all be dialed in and uh, depending on what works and what's best for the for the operation um yeah we we ultimately the the name of the game obviously is um how do we um ensure that the player experience is uh, is improved and i know um yeah historically in your first year in 2020 um the round times at Fieldstone were something that you wanted to work on. And then uh, very quickly, you got uh, tremendous results. Um, and obviously, at the time, you had people out to try and move things forward. And obviously, we're spending money and labor hours on that. Uh, but there were a lot of five hour days of uh, yeah, what you what you're telling me. So if, if I'm remembering that correctly. Um, no, you're exactly right. Five hours was the norm at Fieldstone and plus five. And a lot of times we were happy to get people, if we got them finished with a number that started with five, that was a successful day. Um, it's It certainly has changed since then. Uh, things have, uh, have really changed. And obviously, again, the, the data doesn't, uh, doesn't lie. And I can just imagine that uh, it would have been quite tricky to manage um five hour rounds coming in that said in 2020 also again going back to the conversation with earlier people were just so happy to be out playing golf right they probably weren't as critical but uh, again now a couple of years on um that uh, that has certainly changed again um 
so what our team does is we have uh, obviously data scientists and a customer success team that is available to help um, for with reporting at any time. And, and what they do by default is they do a, a really nice end of year or end of season report, uh, which is obviously nice to report back to um, the ownership or committee or whatever your structures is. Um, and there's a lot of data that is uh, really useful to to take a look at. But um, at Fieldstone, you you are running quite a tight ship, uh, chip, and um, you actually set your system up to a goal time of four fifteen, even though your official goal time at the club that you advertise is four thirty, right? That's correct. Um, so why don't you just set up the system to 4.30 and uh, everything's green and happy? Because <laughs> that's too easy. That doesn't push people. And I wanted to, I actually had it, at one time I had it at 4.08. Um, mm. And then my two assistants talked me into moving it to 4.15. And they were probably right. Um, it does create some issues at 415 where people actually, so people are attuned to the system now. They know where their pace is. As you showed earlier, mm. they're seeing it on the screen. So when I go talk to someone, if we have to send someone out or send me out to talk to someone, they can use the same data um, that I have access to. So I need to be careful that we're we're talking to the right people in the right place at the right time. Sure. Someone who someone who finds out that we're actually running a four hour, 15 minute goal pace and they're six minutes under that they're they become quick to remind me that, hey, your advertised your advertised pace of play is four hours and 30 minutes. I know you guys push that number 15 minutes. Yeah. So we're doing just fine. Well, I think it's point, great. You're and, probably uh, right. And uh, look, uh, the obviously the data tells a story and your story of the season is 424 right um and it's been busy again uh, but let me just point out two um data points here and the one is how you can analyze your runtime across certain day segments so your seven um o'clock your um early bird um early run starting at 335 so that's really how quick you can play fieldstone and then you're going at four or five and then obviously the eight to 10, that's your your top. That's where you're busiest. The gray bar is a play volume, but also um, that is when the play time goes into 422, 428. Obviously then the average balances out again, but you never want this to go over uh, 430, which you're doing. You're always staying under. Here's 430, even in your afternoon, 430. And that's the that's what you're advertising. And that's the, the standard you're actually holding um, yourself to. So it's, it's really great. I mean, it's your entire season and it shows that um, there isn't a single tea time basically on, on aggregate on average that goes beyond that. And that I would say makes for very happy players. Um, there's one other data point um, that I think is important to point out is that it, this style up here shows that there's just a few delaying groups impacting many, many, many others. Those are the oranges, right? The orange groups that are about 50 nine percent have been delayed or impacted by just a few and look again um chip has set up the system to be um uh, a really really hard benchmark right uh, if we reanalyze this at 4 30 it would look very different um but it shows the trend is that a few groups impact so many and that is why it it's uh it's so important to really stay on top of things and get on top of things early and keep communicating also with players so that you don't have two or three groups de derailing the day for you and impacting 10 or 20 others. Um, so again, this is a well done, well done, uh, great, great job. And here's what this looks like. Um, on a busy day at Fieldstone, you have 250 players out. Um, and this day actually came in at 4.01 four hours, one minute, and uh, there's one or two groups that are a slight bit over, but everything runs smoothly because uh, you've been on top of things. Um, and again, uh, what, what do people do when they now have an additional half an hour than, than they thought they would, right? 
I would wager they go spend it with you guys in your clubhouse, right? And uh, and spend more money with you. In the golf shop. Yeah, they are. And they're happier. Um, They're happier. If I can get. So going back, if you went back to that other screen, I can tell you when a good Saturday or Sunday is going to be is when I can get those, when I can get those tea times from nine to 10, if I can keep them under four hours, it's going to be a really good day. Mm -hmm. When those tea times bump up, that's when we start to have some issues. And you and I, you and I talked about this, but I'll say it again. Um, I can pretty much identify who those groups are on a Saturday or Sunday. And we try our best to steer them away from those early times. Sometimes we were able to successfully do that. Sometimes we're not able to do that. Sometimes they just go online and book. But I can I can literally tell on a Saturday by the names on the T sheet before 10 a.m. what kind of day we're going to have. Um, that also says a lot about your repeat play profiles, right? That you just know your players now. And, and it's great to have such a high uh, repeat play uh, score. Did you know that... Um, uh, there's data that suggests that in daily fee golf, up to 48% of first-time visitors to a golf course do not return. So you have they've heard about your course or you've spent money advertising and 48% of a first-time visitor doesn't return. I, I would think it's not that at all at, at Fieldstone. But no, this, is a huge, this is a huge challenge, right? Uh, because we spend the money and uh, they're coming once and then they don't come back. Or what have we done wrong, Right. Uh, right. So the the mission would be how can we cut that in half and how can we t- take a, a first time visitor and get them to come back five times, um and uh, build loyalty, um and I do think that again like if you your on course service and the the conditioning and the the pace and flow of play is great and you've got uh, a good friendly knowledgeable staff that looks after the players, that's when they want to come back, um, again uh going back to one of the points you raised earlier that uh, you have been uh, successful in increasing your green fees and we did say that this is a a triple effort by obviously having a good t-sheet but also having dynamic pricing which you've dialed in quite nicely and then delivering on your um and executing on on your service out on the golf course tell us a bit about about that and one of the things that before we jump into some some percentage improvements that would be quite important um one of the things that i'm very excited that you've started to do is to really speed up your morning golf and uh do a concept that we uh, named uh, fast lane golf um how is that working uh, um out for you guys and also how is that helping your dynamic pricing and has it generated additional capacity for you So I think this might be a good time to speak a little bit to dynamic pricing. So dynamic pricing is unique for for North Metro and really all of Michigan, North Metro Detroit, but really all of Michigan, although there are more and more facilities that are are moving to dynamic pricing all the time. Um, I feel like we were the first and um, we were a little nervous about doing that. Um, but it was really a two-prong approach. Um, so dynamic pricing and a five-plus hour round of golf don't mix very well. So I had to I had to do some things to improve pace of play, and that allowed for more starting times during the day. And then um, that was tag marshal, and then dynamic pricing came in with at the same time and those two together have really kind of hit the nail on the head from a revenue perspective for us. So you talk about our fast lane golf that we, we do in the morning. um, And you see those 7 a.m. sub early bird rounds at 341. And even from seven to eight, you're at, um, we're at 409 on average. And again, we have some people that, that will, commit to playing on those that fast a pace but i know for a fact when their name's on the t-sheet they're not going to do it um so we struggle with them early in the round and um it typically sets off the whole day um it gradually gets better once they clear the golf course um we usually see pace of play start to pick up and this is a really good example of 
of it starting to go back down, but it's not till it's not till one or two o'clock in the afternoon before we really start to see that change. Interestingly enough, uh, Chip, this is actually data from 2021, and you can see that there's still a four hour 53 segment. Right. Four or nine. So if we're looking at the data that you have now, let me just jump back here. Um, your seven to eight is actually five minutes improved, and there isn't that 11, 12 is now half an hour better, right? So you've right. still gotten better from, from 2021. Um, so I'm... Uh, what I, what I wanted to obviously show is that the, the principle of fast lane golf is that if you know, and again, like your your early rounds this year, where in that season it was 341, now in 335. So again, you're seeing a six minute improvement right? Um, because you're advertising it as such and, and so on. But uh, the, the concept is that if you have players moving significantly quicker than your goal time, you can actually uh, tighten your intervals and you can free up um, additional tee off times um, in this critical window. And like you said, you want to obviously do dynamic pricing and uh, you were an early mover on that. And uh, it seems to be working really well for you, but you have to deliver on the experience one, but also if you have additional inventory to sell at that high price point, that's a triple win for you, right? No, um, and it's so said... great to see that you've done this. As you said, we were our tea time is our tea time. Tea times on the weekend are at nine minutes, but those early tea times are at eight minutes. Um, that's at an additional mm -hmm. one and a half tea times every hour. An additional one and a half tea times every hour times ninety nine dollars. It's pretty easy mm -hmm. to do the math and see over the course of the season that can be some real incremental revenue. Um. And there's another um, data point that actually shows that, especially under 40 year olds, in fact, it's over 50% of under 40 year olds will pay up to 25% more for a significantly faster round. So that is exactly um, the player base that you're trying to attract uh, for these, and they'd be happy to pay more. So again, it ties in so nicely with dynamic pricing. Um, but let's look at some of the, the actual outcomes here, because um, obviously, for us, the the goal is always how can we save you money, um, reduce labor hours, make you more efficient. But then, how can we help you generate money with what is the economic engine of your golf course, and how can we get smart around um, the the optimization and create additional capacity? So you have done exceptionally well over the period. Uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about the 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 improvements that you've been able to. Um, facilitate here from a greens um, revenue perspective? So if we were definitely up from 2019 to 2020, just with COVID, we were definitely up. And like I said earlier, I kind of felt like that might've been the high watermark for, for particularly Fieldstone, but for the golf business in general was COVID, that pandemic year. And then coming out of the pandemic, a, li a little bit out of the pandemic in 2021, our revenue bumped up 25% from what we did in 2020. And then we bumped up another 25% in 2022 from what we did in 2021. And I'm like, well, certainly we've reached the top. And this year will be the best revenue year on the golf side that Fieldstone has ever had since we opened in 1998. Um, which for us, I I feel very fortunate. I am also, it's an easy conversation to have with, with folks um, on city council and um, they, they definitely understand and they definitely see the revenue gains that we've made at Fieldstone from the changes that we've made. And they also see, you didn't really touch on it, but we can kind of at the bottom, you have reduced labor expenses. My labor expenses are down just because I don't have I don't have player assistants riding the golf course trying to figure out what's going on. We basically, a lot of days, we don't even, we just send someone from, from outside services to manage a situation on the golf course that I can't, I'm unable to manage from, from the monitor or the PC in the golf shop. Um, that's not even a, that's not even a player assistant, but I do not have player assistants that ride around the golf course trying to manage play. Um, we send people to problems and we correct the problem at that point. 
Um, yeah, that's that's phenomenal. And in in your books, obviously, if, if I understand correctly, the food and beverage is actually outsourced. So you're generating additional opportunity for that side of the business, uh, but it's um, it's not managed by you at this point. Uh, but would you say that, um, like, if you if you dug into that performance wise, uh, that would go alongside uh, the greens revenue gains, and they would have also seen gains in in uh, what they're doing. I think their incremental gains are similar to ours. They don't share that data with me, but um, I would. I've had enough. I've had enough ancillary conversations with um, with the food and beverage owners and um, food and beverage staff that I feel like they're they're mirroring us. Yeah. So, uh, Chip, again, this doesn't happen by chance, right? This is by design. And I again, want to congratulate you and your team for uh, just incrementally getting better and better, and dialing into technology and also being willing to to try new things. Um, it's such a pleasure to see. And if we're looking at this effectively 2019 to today, you've basically doubled uh, your uh, your greens revenue. And that's just phenomenal result. And as much as a critic might say, well, what about inflation? <laughs> um, this is way, way, way bigger than uh, than that, right? And, and it's also way bigger than just a 15, 20% bump up uh, in, in additional play. And really it comes down to having generated capacity delivering on your service promise. And that allows you to really drive smart dynamic pricing strategies. Um, because yeah, in simple terms, if you're around that used to cost yesterday, uh, cost, cost $55 yesterday, tomorrow costs $99 because it's a key time and it's dynamically priced. The expectation goes up alongside that, right? And if you don't deliver, you can only do it so many times before people say, well, but that's not worth it. I'm not going coming back here right but um again like your repeat play return play profile and uh, the fact that you're always busy uh, speaks to the excellent service that you're generating so you know, you've you touched on a point that i don't want to leave for for just one second you you mentioned the word what about inflation we hmm. haven't raised our published rates since night since 2020 our published rate is still the published rate that it was in 2020 Mm -hmm. And this revenue growth has occurred because of dynamic pricing, but we wouldn't be able to dynamic price if we were still taking people five plus hours to get around a golf course. Mm -hmm. Dynamic pricing wouldn't work. Yeah. Um, no, great. And again, let me do another shout out quickly here to uh, to um, uh, Four Up and, and Sagacity because we feel like we work really well with with them in in combination. Uh, but let's take a quick look at next season. And we're almost out of time here, Chip. And uh, at this point, if any of you have uh, online have any questions for Chip um, or for myself, uh, please shoot them through in the Q&A. We're trying to answer. Uh, one of the things I know that you're interested in, Chip, uh, for next season to look at is uh, potentially dialing in your superintendent more. And I've got two examples here. One is a, um, the heat map where we're looking at where do carts go, where don't they go? And the goal here is to one, protect areas that get a lot of traffic. Maybe we couldn't even see, we don't even know because we don't have eyes on it all the time. But also there's areas where players never go, right? And there might be savings opportunities. Why are we throwing the same amount of labor, irrigation, fertilizer into an area that never gets any, any traffic? So there's opportunities. And then also just from an efficiencies point of view, uh, tracking the vehicles, and especially if you overlay both on the same map, the superintendent very quickly can see, hey, there's gaps in the field, we can get things done. Um, and just having more line of sight, understanding why certain mow patterns are more efficient than others from a time um, standpoint of view. And again, much like you've done, the more you understand it, the more data you have, the better you can improve. So uh, that that would be interesting to, uh, to dig into. And then I know that you've got a particular a challenge at your course, given the uh, the layout, you have what you call a double stop, and you're wrapping your head around that. Just explain that problem to us briefly. It's the single biggest problem we face at Fieldstone regarding pace of play. So our ninth hole and our eleventh hole both return to the clubhouse. Everyone's everyone's accustomed to stopping after nine. 
And what's great is they get then can go back and they can play 10 and 11, and then they can stop again. So we struggle with that. So we have, um, we've taken some of the advertising modules, um, particularly on the ninth hole, and we've put in, we put up screens to say it, tell people, please continue to 10 and make your clubhouse stop after hole number 11. I would say better than 50, 50, they, they will do that. They'll play 10 and 11 and they'll stop, but we still have a large number contingent of our guests that will stop after nine and stop again after 11. And that's the biggest struggle that I have. So we're working on, on how we can best overcome that, that issue. And we've not been successful with overcoming it yet, but we're still working on it. And then you mentioned um, earlier interventions, and I think this is all me. Um, I kind of always said that number one and number two were two really difficult holes, and I never really worried about monitoring pace of play until someone finished the third green. Let's see where they are after they get to when they get to 40, and let's figure out where they are on pace. And um, mostly through conversations with the tag marshal team um, in our season end wrap up, we kind of realized that maybe we need to look at that sooner than that. Maybe we need to start looking at that after they, you know, after they, after they trigger and their round triggers um, right off of the first tee Our first tee and first hole are adjacent to the range. So occasionally we'll get a lost ball or some issues there um, down the left side. And it's a really difficult hole, mm -hmm. but we need to be, we need to be more intuitive and, and more responsive in how we are handling those earlier interventions. And then you mentioned the superintendent opportunities. And the tag for tag Marshall 4.0, um, from what I understand, I'll leave that one to you to to answer that. But... Yeah, that you you don't know that uh, chip other than having maybe the odd, had the odd preview with our customer success team. But um, our system is getting um, an overhaul again into what we call 4.0. That's our fourth generation. Um, and there's some really exciting upgrades that we're doing. And the one is. Um, it's a fully customizable interface of your live map. So you can really, you can show certain modules that are right for you, like the gap time monitor or uh, your day info, your uh, time schedule. You can set this up in a way that an interface that works for you and with the things that you want to see, because we realize not every golf course is the same and every manager has got um, certain metrics that um, really count for them. So we want to make that more, um, customizable and then also the tea times and again we're excited here to work with uh, four up and another uh, good tea sheets uh, where we have tea times pulling in automatically um, but one of the things that in the past uh, an operator would do is assign a golf cart uh, to a tea time so that we know the names attached to the cart so we are, have now automated that so as of next season um, this will automatically assign um, Obviously, if there's major um, uh, adjustments of the, the the effective start times and they're no longer in correlation with your tee times, eventually the system will ask you, "Well, help me out here, right? Uh, where we uh, is this group really the group that uh, that we uh, that I think it is?" Uh, but it will be two or three interventions a day rather than having thirty or so assignments that that need to be done. Uh, so we believe that's going to be a nice time saver. Um, and then there's other opportunities, but uh, I don't want to get into it, but I'm, I'm super excited. And Chip, if you're coming down to the PGA show again, please uh, come and book a meeting with our team and they can introduce you uh, to some of the new things that are coming. Um, the question and last question, uh, because this is indeed our last slide, even though I'm going the wrong way. Um, are you coming down to the PGA show and are you bringing any one of your young guns along this uh, next year? I am coming to the pga show um i don't i think i'm a, i think i'm the lone person coming to the pga show from fieldstone this year um so i i'd like to try to wait figure out a way to incorporate them into that trip um and kind of kind of help grow them a little bit but it's not going to happen this year but i will be down at the show so there you will be the eyes and ears 
um, for the rest of the team and report back to them. And we look forward to seeing you, Chip. Um, thank you so much for uh, your time again and your insight today. It's always a pleasure and congratulations again on your continued performance. Uh, you must make um, the powers that be at the city of Auburn very happy. And that I'm sure that's not that didn't always used to be the case at a municipal golf course. So well done. And uh, yeah, really delighted for you. And uh, but again, it, it happens by design and with a lot of effort. So but it shows and uh, fantastic season. It's not quite finished yet. You have a few more days. When are you looking to shut down? So we're closed right now for this. Golf is closed for the season. Um, we're still open, golf shop's still open. We'll have Christmas sales and and some folks in and out. Um, but this is pretty much the this has pretty much been the end of the golf season in, in Michigan. And we're on this everyone's on to ski season now. <laughs> Almost, yeah. So it goes. Um okay, you stay warm until we see you down in Florida, Chip. Sounds again, good. thanks very much. And uh, it's been great and uh, look forward to catching up with you again um, soon and hopefully also grab a beer with you. Sounds great. I look forward to it. Thank you, Chip. All the best. Thank you.